I like them a lot for a few reasons, but I also don't like them for a few other reasons. So let's talk about that. Dyn Audio sent me a pair of the Emit 20 speakers, speakers over my shoulder. So while I show you, well, hold on. They didn't give them to me. They loaned them to me. All right, I got that out of the way. While I show you some video of the speaker up close, I'm going to go through some of the specs. The average sensitivity is stated at 86 decibels from the manufacturer with a power handling rating of 160 watts and a rated impedance of about 6 ohms. The tweeter is a 28 millimeter Serotar soft dome with hexus material. And then the mid-range woofer is an 18 centimeter mid-range driver. Crossover is a two-way design. Crossover is a first order on the tweeter and second order on the woofer. Now the speaker does allow you to plug the port using this little bung. So you can plug it into the bung. Once again, the word bung, it's, just, it's weird. But I did all my listening in ported mode only. And I will tell you up front, I really like this speaker. They run about 780, I think, dollars per pair, at least currently. I like them a lot for a few reasons, but I also don't like them for a few other reasons. So let's talk about that. The bass on these speakers is unreal. I was listening to my standard tracks and I was thinking, does this speaker really get down to 40 hertz in room? Because the bass output was nuts for a bookshelf sized speaker. And it's on the larger side for a bookshelf speaker, but it's a bookshelf sized speaker. It gets low. One of my test tracks that I use for bass, and how low does the bass go? is Young Jeezy or just Jeezy's put on. Plays a few different tones and one of the tones is 40 hertz and I was holding up my phone. Sure enough, it was hitting 40 hertz like it was nobody's business. But below that, when the next tone comes in and it's around, I think maybe 32 hertz, the bass falls off on the speaker. So once they get down to about 40 hertz, then they start to fall off. But getting down to 40 hertz with a pair of speakers like this, bookshelf speakers, I could almost say that for most music, not all music, but for most music, you'd probably be okay without having to buy a subwoofer. And that's something I very, very rarely say because most bookshelf speakers, if they get down to 50 hertz in room with good authority, then that's doing good. That's saying something. But for these to get down to 40 hertz in room without an issue, I think the F3 on these is around 50 hertz and the F10 is somewhere in the 30 hertz region. We'll see that in the data shortly, but no problem getting down low. The mid-range to me is very nice, except for I actually wrote in my notes, there's a problem that I heard around 600 to 800 hertz and it just felt like the snares didn't have enough thwack to it. It didn't have enough meat. So I wrote that down in my notes. Also in my notes, I wrote that it sounded like around 10 kilohertz or so there was a lift because cymbals, hi-hats, tended to have a little bit too much shimmer and it sounded unnatural. These speakers have very low distortion down to 40 hertz anechoically. I didn't have any issues with playing these speakers loud. The compression data actually looks really good for these as well. It seemed to me that these speakers do a really good job of maintaining the directivity of the radiation stability at about plus or minus 50 degrees up through the upper treble, which is what I liked and what I keyed in on. And it made the soundstage sound wider than I'm used to hearing with other bookshelf speakers, especially ones that implement a waveguide because they're already a little bit narrow in the lower treble, that two to four kilohertz. Conversely, dome tweeters on a flat baffle will have wide radiation up until about eight kilohertz where the beaming starts to occur. And so this speaker kind of strikes that line a little bit because it has, I don't know. Okay, so they probably call it a waveguide and technically, sure, it's a waveguide, but it's more of a beveled edge around the tweeter. So I don't know that I would consider it a, a waveguide in the way that most of you probably would consider a waveguide. So just kind of keep that in mind. But it does seem to do a good job of striking that balance between having wider radiation than a horn-loaded, nestled in tweeter into a waveguide, but also maintaining wide radiation a little bit higher than a tweeter on a flat baffle. So it strikes a good balance, at least to my ears. That's what I heard. I mentioned resonance earlier. 
that six to eight hundred sound, it sounded somewhat thin, maybe muffled. Snares didn't quite have the thwack, the impact, the the timbre and the tonality, the richness that I was looking for that I expect when you have neutral response through that region. And the data clearly shows that there's a resonance in the driver. And I'm gonna show you more about that in a little bit. So now let's look at some of the data that I've gathered using my Clipple Near Field Scanner, which is a state-of-the-art robotic device that allows me to get anechoic data in a non-anechoic environment. The first thing we're gonna look at is the impedance. And we can see that the nominal impedance uh, is about 5.5 or so ohm. They state six ohm, I'm good with that. Overall, it should be a pretty easy speaker to drive on a standard amplifier. The thing I wanted to note though, and I called it out here, was this resonance. I've drawn this box through here and it shows you that there's a pretty strong resonance that shows up in the impedance. And I was curious what that was. I measured the woofer, the tweeter, and the port all near field. And this is the response I got. And in the port, which is red, you can see that the resonance is still showing up. If you don't know any better, you would think, oh, the port is creating the resonance. Well, that's not the case here because when I measured the speaker sealed, that resonance was still there. So then you're left with either some kind of cabinet vibration or the driver. Well, the easiest thing to do is to just measure the raw driver, this guy. If you wanna see a closer view, here you go. Big old magnet and a debucking magnet on the back, it looks like. This is the raw impedance of the raw drive unit. I wanna make sure you understand this is the speaker, the driver, I should say, removed from the enclosure. And in that impedance sweep, we can see this peak right here. Now I thought this is a stamp steel frame woofer, which I'll be honest with you guys, I expected more, okay? I just expected more. My thought was if I can use some constrained layer damping, CLD, a lot of you probably just know it as sound deadener, what happens if I attach that to the frame? And here's a picture of what I'm talking about. So I cut out little strips of CLD and position it on the spokes of the frame. Now I ran another impedance sweep on the woofer itself. It didn't resolve this resonance, which means that there's something else going on and I couldn't tell you exactly what it is because I'm not gonna destroy the woofer to find out, but I'm not making a mountain out of a molehill when I say that the resonance from the woofer imparts a sound characteristic in that six to 800 Hertz region that I just didn't care for. And what do I mean? Well, here we go. So around that six to 800 Hertz region, we have a about plus three dB peak followed immediately by a negative 3 dB dip. Now the peak to me didn't stand out and I don't think that's quite what I heard. What I heard was this dip and that's where I felt like the thwack, again, I'm using that word because I don't know how else to describe it. This is a subjective term and I hope you kind of understand what I'm talking about of snares and maybe a little bit of a muffled sound, slightly muffled, not a big deal, occurred when I was listening to the speakers. The data shows what I heard, because I wrote down six to 800 Hertz, so it's right in that region and it makes sense to me that that's what I'm seeing in the data. Is it gonna be an issue to you? I don't know. How big of an issue was it to me? Pretty minor. Would I accept the trade-off of the low bass extension? Look at this. F3 of 54 Hertz, F10 of 33 Hertz. Yeah, I think so. And with some minor equalization, I could bring that peak down and I could bring this up just a smidge and smooth that right out. And in fact, that's what I did with my mini DSP 2x4 HD. I tweaked that down a little bit and I was like, yeah, that's, that's what I like. That's what I expected to hear when I fired these speakers up to begin with. Going a little bit further, we can see that there is another peak of about around four kilohertz. And that's what that sharp edgy sound that I was talking about tends to occur. And then going higher in frequency, we can see above 10 kilohertz, there's a boost of about five decibels. And that's what I heard when I heard that shimmery sound standing out. Like certain tracks, it shouldn't have stood out as much as it did. Honestly, technically speaking, these are problematic and I would prefer that they had been a little bit smoother because I heard this, I heard this, and I heard this. But none of them were enough to really make me not enjoy the speaker. And with a couple bands of EQ, you can clean this right up and have that great, great low deep bass extension out of a moderately sized bookshelf speaker that costs about $750 to $800. So that's not a bad deal. I also wanna point out that the measure sensitivity that I got was about 83.5 decibels at 2.83 volt one meter, the standard. This is the CEA 2034 data at zero degrees. And then I switched over to 30 degrees to see what happens when you 
place the speakers like some might. You know, you don't tow the speaker directly at you all the time. Some speakers are better designed to be pointing directly at you while others are designed to be pointing a little bit away from you or parallel with the back wall. So when I flip to 30 degrees, this is what we get. High frequency shelving, which is what I expected. Still the resonance remains because it's low enough in frequency where that's not beaming. If you switch over to the estimated in-room response, which we have here at zero degrees in black and 30 degrees in red, we can see that they kind of line up within about a decibel or so of each other, most frequencies until the higher frequencies around maybe about eight kilohertz or so, they start to diverge more. And this is kind of why I say that maybe 10 to 15 degrees might work better for you like it did for me because splitting that difference right through here got rid of some of that upper frequency. It just sounded unnatural above 10 kilohertz. So it got kind of, it kind of got rid of that. And I've drawn a trend line in here, giving you an idea of what I heard when I listened to the speaker in my room. And so I'm pointing out a few things. Extended bass down to 40 hertz in room. Muffled sound in that six to 800 hertz region. Lacking some definition around maybe two to three kilohertz. So do that little dip right here, but really it's due to this peak right here. And then some sharp sound on male vocals. I didn't highlight this 10 kilohertz and above response because I just didn't have enough room. For horizontal radiation, you're about plus or minus 50 to 60 degrees, depending on what frequency you're talking about. And you can see what I was saying about how the upper frequency remains relatively constant. Vertically, there's some things to point out, and it's due to the fact that this speaker uses shallow slopes on their crossover. Most speakers are gonna have a notch somewhere in the response, either above or below the reference line, which in this case is the tweeter. And usually that occurs in the upper mid-range area where the crossover is between the woofer to the tweeter. And you, you see it once, and usually it's on the lower end of that crossover point. But in this case, we see two of them. The reason we see two of them is because the tweeter also has a really shallow slope. And there is some sort of lobing, some sort of cancellation effect that happens as you go above the tweeter line in this five kilohertz area. So I've called it out here and I was kind of really wanted to bring your attention to it because some people love shallow order slopes, but the downside to those is that you have issues off axis, especially vertically, horizontally, Usually not a big deal unless the crossover point is just way too far apart between the uh, the mid woofer and the tweeter. But vertically, that's usually when you see issues. And this is a really good indication, a really good example of why shallow order slopes can also be problematic. And kind of gets back to one of my points that I consistently make that there is no perfect speaker. So this is a compromise in the design that Don Audio has chosen to make. Distortion. Very low at 86 decibels at one meter. Uh, what is this? Down to 40 hertz, it's below 1% THD. And then at 96 decibels, you can still see that we're below 3% THD and you're still down to about 40 hertz before there's a high rise in distortion. Now, most of the time what's gonna happen is two-way bookshelf speakers, they're gonna start increasing distortion around 80 hertz and they're gonna start going through the roof right through here. In this case, you're just not seeing it. So this woofer, can get down low. Multitone distortion, however, shows a different story. And this to me indicates maybe that there may not be a shorting ring used in the mid woofer itself. The reason I say this is because it's showing higher levels of distortion in the mid range area. And usually that's due to some kind of asymmetry or the fact that there's not a shorting ring used in the magnet structure to kind of help lower the inductance distortion. I don't know if that's true, that's just a hunch. But the other thing that I want to point out too is that here's this resonance and this resonance is increasing high in distortion. That actually may be one of the things that's driving that distortion up so high. The high frequency area above what about six kilohertz or so distortion drops down low. So that's not an issue. I, I got to tell you that I push these speakers pretty dang hard. I didn't really have any issues with audible distortion. And some of that may just be because the bass was so awesome that I was just fixated on how great the bass extension was. Here is the compression linearity graphic. And once again, that resonance is showing a problem. It's showing a sharp Q compression dip right through here. So that's an area where you may or may not hear another issue due to that resonance. And I say another issue, what I mean is I heard it in the tonality and in the timbre but you might hear it in the overall, overall, I should say, 
dynamic range. So that may impact your own listening, depending on the volume and the distance that you're listening at. Other than that, however, I got to say this compression looks pretty dang good. I'm really impressed with the overall compression linearity of the speaker, namely on the extreme ends. I mean, they're stacking up down here. That's an enhancement. But a lot of times what you'll see is you'll see sharp compression issues down here below about 100 hertz, which just means that the bass doesn't sound similar from low to high volume. And in this case, it's it's within about a decibel. I think that's okay. So to sum it up, I actually really do like this speaker. My only gripe about it is that resonance between six to 800 hertz, because that's the only thing that in my listening that I consistently felt like something's not right in that area. And then when I looked at the measurements after all of my listening, because that's what I do, I saw that resonance. I said, there's the issue. When I equalized it down and then brought it back up a little bit and fixed that little thing, it resolved the issue. So that's how I know for sure that's what it is. The response radiation pattern is reasonably wide at about plus or minus 50 to 60 degrees, and it stays pretty constant until about 13 kilohertz or so. As I said earlier, that's pretty rare. Most of the time you don't get that. The bass extension anechoic is great. The bass extension in room is great. I mean, if you want good bass out of a bookshelf speaker and you don't want to pay up for a subwoofer, you could consider this. As I said, I normally don't say stuff like that, but this is one of those rare exceptions. I did find that directly on axis is a little bit too bright above 10 kilohertz. That cymbal, too much shimber, synth sounds sound a little bit unnatural, which I guess I should go without saying synth is unnatural, but hopefully you understand what I mean. Uh, off axis seems to be the best compromise at about 10 to 15 degrees. And overall, I would say that it's a very easy to listen to speaker, overall enjoyable. And I do recommend it despite it not quite being perfect. But it is worth noting, and I really want to point this out, that when I posted a teaser picture of this speaker to my YouTube page, a lot of you all, I say a lot, maybe like five or six of you all had said you'd listen to the speaker and you just weren't a fan. Now, some of you said you liked it, but I think this is a good example of a speaker that has some great features, but then some issues that are not great. And depending on what you are wanting to get out of the speaker for the price, those issues may be bothersome to you. Me, I was in admiration of the bass and the wide-ish radiation pattern, the consistency of it, that I'm willing to let go of some of the other faults, but you may not feel the same way. So if you do decide to order these or buy them, make sure you get them from a place that has a good return policy, just in case you don't like them. I will throw out a little cheap plug for myself. If you want to buy them, I will have an Amazon affiliate link in the comment section below. I get like 4% commission off of that. It's not a lot, but it does help me. If you send it back, they take the commission back away from me. So uh, it's really up to you if you want to use it or not, or you can go local or you can buy through whoever else you want. But if you do that route, just know that that is appreciated. Alternatively, if you'd like to support me, you can do so at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. And I think that's going to be it for this video. I hope you learned something. I hope you got something useful out of it. And if you do own these speakers or have heard these speakers, feel free to comment in the section below. Let me know what you think about my review. If we align, if we misalign, if you feel maligned by what I've said. And with that, I will talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.